the element of freedom. It surrounds us and fills us, it is our atmosphere, everything we perceive is nothing. It lets us breathe, carries heat and sound across our planet, and stands as a protective barrier against the cruel vacuum of space. Hello everyone, the Green Scorpion here, and welcome to week 2 of Weapons Month 4, where we are now discussing arguably the most graceful and versatile of the elemental masters, the Aeromancers. Though not the most popular element to control, air is the most immediately vital to our survival, so omnipresent that it ironically escapes our notice. It's our very atmosphere. Without it, the outside pressures acting on our bodies would disappear. We would literally explode. Honestly, I think there's a lot of potential with this element still going untapped, but today's 10 tornado tossers still leave their enemies breathless with their powers over wind. Wind is defined as the observable phenomenon of air in motion, normally as a current. As such, it is the more weaponized form of air and often used interchangeably as the name of the element itself. Semantics aside, shaping the winds provides a lot of versatility in how you approach challenges. Unless you're in space or in a vacuum, you're usually surrounded by the stuff. And as a gas, it can be shaped and formed however necessary with the right apparatus. The flimsiness of a gas may make it weak at first, but look around the world for just a few examples of the possible strength of enough howling gales. Windmills are built to try to harness just a fraction of their power, and entire mountains are shaped by them over time. But despite being the element of freedom, there just aren't as many dedicated wind wakers as some of the more common elements. And before you ask, no, Link is not on the list, you can put your guns away. Characters like Link and Sonic may embody the spirit of the element and occasionally utilize it, but for this list I'm looking for dedicated practitioners who can blow away the competition. So batten down the hatches, it's time for the Top 10 Video Game Aeromancers! Whoa! Weapons Month 1 throwback! If you remember back at my Top 10 Spear Wielders, you'll probably recognize Zoltan from Kingdom Hearts 2, and you might recall that I was pretty generous to him. By that, I mean that I called him the best spear wielder of all time, and that really hasn't changed for me. So I won't be reiterating his backstory or how well he uses his SIX, six FREAKING lances. LANCES! But like Axel, not only does Zaldan sport his weapons, the Wind Lances, he also commands an element, air. That is a deadly combination right there. So you might be wondering what he's doing here at number 10. Believe me, I love this guy, and you guys know it. But when I think about him, I think about the Spearmaster, not the Aeromancer. Granted that he does use his wind powers to enhance his weapon mastery, but in ways too subtle. Still, I can't just ignore everything he has going for him, so I'll take another look and evaluate him as a wind wielder. Besides, Zaldan's a great first example for some common wind moves. He likes to keep himself protected with the spell Arrow, surrounding himself in a constant ball of wind that deflects a lot of the force from all physical attacks. Combined with his mile-long health bar, he's not dying anytime soon. And while he usually can just levitate his weapons with his mind like the other nobodies, Zaldan sometimes uses the wind to spin them around just a little faster. His lances also combine into a dragon or a hydra that fires a huge gale of damaging wind that Sora does not want to get caught in. In fact, we might as well use Zaldan as a lesson on how wind is most commonly used in games. Windshield? Check. Attack based on circular patterns? Check. Flight or improved jumping? Check. Big stream of wind? That's a big check right there. You'll notice that oftentimes in video games, wind has this kind of slashing effect, like a lot of wind spells are used as ranged blades. I suppose that goes with an early Japanese trope of describing some samurai swords as being so fast they slice the air. And yeah, he's tough. It can be hard to notice behind all of the spinning spears of steel, but there's always some air manipulation going on around him. Just. Maybe not enough to take my mind off those whirling blades and tips. Despite it being one of the four main elements, you don't see a ton of wind magic in fantasy games. Most RPGs stick to the elemental trinity, fire, ice, and electricity. That always made Fire Emblem interesting to me. There, magic is often divided into light, dark, and anima, aka elemental magic and anima is further split into thunder, fire, and wind. While in the GBA games all you needed was loot or Eric to master all three of those, the GameCube title shook things up slightly by subdividing mages into even deeper specialization. That's where we find Soren, who starts off Path of Radiance as a wind mage. He's also what's known in Tellius as a branded, 
son of both a Bjork, or regular human, and a Laguz, or shapeshifter. His mother was a dragon Laguz, meaning that Soren is one quarter dragon, and that's awesome! Though unable to transform, Branded often have a pension for spellcasting, and Soren is no exception, bringing his considerable talents to the Grail mercenaries. He's a shrewd scholar, a master tactician, and eventually becomes Ike's closest confidant and best friend. Soren is another iffy choice for me because he still has easy access to thunder and fire, but his class gives him added skill and power to wind tomes, which when red emits emerald-colored gales at enemy units. Wind mages eventually upgrade into wind sages, and in Radiant Dawn, they become arch sages. Following this path, they eventually get the SS weapon level in wind tomes, meaning he can use the most powerful stratus magic known to man, the dreaded Rex Caliber. There's another wind mage named Bastion who, I have to admit, is also pretty great, but with his high magic and resistance and above average speed, not to mention plenty of chances to level him up, Soren is widely considered to be the best mage in the game. You still might not want him on the front lines with Ike, but his Elwins and Tornadoes are very accurate and tear apart air units like Pegasus Knights and Ravens. Unique to Fire Emblem, Wind Tones also have the tendency to cool and freeze the air, leading to spells like Blizzard, which has a range of 3 to 10 spaces. The trade-off is that these long-range spells are much less accurate, but don't be surprised to see the Adept Soren landing those hits on far-off flyers. He may not be my favorite mage in the series, but with a little investment, Soren controls the skies. Golden Sun has a way of sneaking under people's radar, even for the most dedicated Nintendo fans. But what better time to jump in than the present, with Golden Sun just sitting there on the Wii U Virtual Console? The game stars four young adepts, warriors with psychic powers augmented by adorable creatures called Jin. Jin come in four elemental types, as do our four heroes. That brings us to Ivan, the Jupiter Adept. Traveling with his adopted father, Ivan is charged to keep hold of a sacred artifact, the Shaman's Rod, a treasure that is almost immediately stolen from him. His adopted father is also kidnapped by brigands, and Ivan joins the party to help them in their world-saving mission and, hopefully in time, straighten out this business with the Rod. It turns out that those two goals are not entirely unrelated. The Jin system in Golden Sun is pretty innovative and allows for a lot of customization through combining different elements, but for the sake of the countdown, let's go with Ivan's optimized class, Windseer. Ivan is the party's black mage with very high magic stats but abysmally low attack, defense, and HP. But even though a stiff breeze can knock him over, he can dish out tenfold what he can take. This means whirlwinds, tornadoes, and... Plasma? Oh right, in Golden Sun, Thunder and Lightning are filed under Wind. That makes sense, Jupiter Adepts can manipulate the air to create low-pressure systems that eventually create storms. Oh, and Jupiter is the Roman equivalent to the Greek god Zeus. I see what you did there, Camelot. As much sense as it makes, though, it means that a lot of Ivan's attacks are electrical, and that's a bit of a negative for me. Even though it's a cool and unique application of aeromancy, it's just... Well, I might be talking more about lightning this month, so I'm not really awarding too many points for lightning here. Ivan's one of the best in the early game for clearing mobs, since his high magic lets him cast synergies faster than his fellow party members. And by meeting with his long-lost sister, Hama, Ivan can discover a hidden Jupiter ability, the ability to read the wind and predict the future. He can even use this ability to cast Reveal and find hidden objects in dungeons. With utility and power, Ivan is a gale force to be reckoned with. If he would just... stop... dying... Jeez, someone get this guy some power bread! <sighs> I wish, and you wish. I would have loved to talk about Talon from Soul Calibur, I really would have. She's adorable, and she's a priestess of wind, but when you really look into the moveset, well, I can't find any actual wind powers happening. Maybe in cutscenes or in the lore, but this is a fighting game. Why can't she bring this stuff into combat? Well, it's not perfect, but I found a replacement. Nanase from Undernight and Birth. Yeah, ever heard of this one? When 
the city is set upon by the enigmatic Hollow Knight, creatures called Void start attacking innocent people. One victim is a middle school student Nanase, who survives the attack but is affected by the abstruse creatures and gains special powers, becoming what is called an Inbird. Nanase specifically gains the power known as EXS Vengeance, also called Windmill, which allows her to control the winds. Where she got her sword Zephyr is beyond me, but it's an interesting choice for an Aeromancer. I mean, Talim has her light elbow blades, but Nanase has this huge broadsword? Also, I know that's your school uniform, but if you're going to be an aerial-based character, you might want to change out of that short skirt. Nanase's powers make her constantly blow the winds, and she channels this force through her sword for some aerodynamic dashes and slicing air cutters. From above, she can launch a wind spiral diagonally that runs along the ground, or she can just blast tornadoes in front of her or counter attacks with a vortex. Those little winglets on her feet also give her a double jump that's great for positioning. It's a lot of simple tools that form together to make a really solid moveset. Oh, and she has a Rasengan. I can't say too much for her character, though. Basically, she spends her story chasing the main character, Hyde, who she thinks is responsible for the Hollow Knight. Then she runs into different women and keeps misinterpreting their dialogue for double entendres. Her entire story revolves around stupid misunderstandings. But that's not a big deal for me in a game like this, I just like the flashy combos. And Nanase's are particularly spectacular. It's a lot of pushing and repositioning to get the opponent into her many multi-hit vortexes. Besides that, all I can say is... Just look at her go! This week's League Champion was a tough call between Yasuo the Unforgiven and John of the Storm's Call. Both incorporate the elements into nearly all of their abilities, but in the end I had to side with Janna. Her abilities and lore are both just a little more dependent on the element, and she doesn't even need the sword for auto attacks. Janna grew up on the streets of Zaun of all places, the city-state known for unethical experimentation in spellcraft and technoturgy. Despite being surrounded by all of the artifice and alchemy, Janna discovered she had a gift for a completely natural force of magic, the element of air. Vowing to rise from her lowly street rat station, she trained tirelessly until the forces of air seemed to speak through her, developing a mastery of the elements to the point where she began to transcend her human form and even show some aspects of an elemental herself. With her newfound power, she defected from Zaun and joined the League to advocate less harmful sorcery practices. Her acclimation to air doesn't stop at casting, however. In her spare time, she became a decorated aviatrix and an informed meteorologist. This is canon! I think? But let's look at her on the fields of justice. Janna is most commonly used as a support, but it's not terribly radical to play her as a mid lane caster. Her main tool is Howling Gale, where she channels a small cyclone. The longer you channel, the bigger the cyclone and the further it travels. It's not the hardest thing to dodge, but if an enemy is too absorbed in grinding minions, they are punished with AP scaling damage and a pretty long knockup. Its range provides some serious poking potential and lets you harass lane opponents even under their tower, making Janna a great partner for Caitlyn. Hey, any friend of Caitlyn is a friend of mine. One rank in Janna's W, Zephyr, summons a small wind elemental who permanently joins Janna, increasing her movement speed. On activation, the elemental attaches itself to an opponent to damage and slow them. Her E is a windshield that not only shields turrets, but can also protect and increase the movement speed for an ally. This stacks with her passive Tailwind, an aura that speeds up nearby allies moving towards her. You'll notice a theme of movement with this set. Janna has remarkably refined influence over the atmosphere of the battlefield, and effortlessly manipulates it to slipstream around allies and thicken around opponents. It's a very subtle but extremely effective use of Aromancy in battle but her ultimate, Monsoon, takes all of that precision and just throws it out the window. Is the enemy team really well positioned? We'll just get in there and pop your ultimate to send them flying every which way. Not only that, the ultimate purifies the air so much that it actually heals all allies in the area. Janna said is very passive and much more team-oriented, landing her at the lower half of this list. But few elementalists can say that they are that well integrated into the environment. Yes, it's true. For only $2.95 a minute, I will leave you breathless. So you're seeing a pattern here, right? Magic, magic, psychomagic, spirity magic, and more magic. Well, how do you manipulate air with technology anyway? 
Attach a fan to your head? Well, that's a nice start, Propeller Knight, but I think we can do better. How about two plane turbines for arms? Your life ends here. I don't think there's a character that better sums up Mad World than Herr Frederick von Trellenkiller. I mean, his name is Herr Frederick von Trellenkiller! Schnell! Mad World is about a twisted television program called Death Watch, in which the producers besiege an unsuspecting city, drop weapons all over the place, and offer the civilians money to kill each other in the most bombastic display possible. A naval captain made the mistake of sailing too close to one of these cities, possibly trying to intervene in the games, and he was boarded by contestants who mutilated him and had him rebuilt as a hellgas cyborg. Yeah, money well spent! His biceps could literally power a 947, but instead they're used to dominate Berrigan City until Jack Kamen rides in to take him down. Twirling Killer intercepts him on the overpass and blocks his way by producing twisters in quick succession. These twisters can fling Jack like a hacky sack, but what's even more perilous are the cars and crates being constantly thrown about. Even if Jack can navigate around them, Twirling Killer's still no slouch. The dude must lift. He has no trouble fighting hand-to-hand -hand with what are clearly tons of metal, spinning himself around and even dishing out wind punches. He can even ride his tornadoes and lift Jack and himself 30 feet in the air. And even when Jack cuts one of his hands off, he's good. He just keeps going. Just a flesh wound. According to the announcers, this guy's been in Death Watch for some time, maybe not as a reigning champion, but as a survivor. Chris Creeley himself was a former Death Watch competitor, but mentions that Twirling Killer once collapsed one of his lungs. Also, he apparently plays bass for a band called the Windbreakers. Um, how? I know he's got fingers, but... Howard? Chris? Anyone? Nope. I would have loved to see this guy in Anarchy Reigns, but seeing that he's now a twirling smoothie, I don't think we can expect him back anytime soon. Then again, if Rin Rin and Black Baron get a pass, why not give the cyborg another spin? Everybody get his ass kicked by Jack, raise your hand. Oh wait, he can't raise his hand, can he? Air today, gone tomorrow. Fucking weak. Quarter guy's gonna love this. Storm Owl from Mega Man X4 is an esteemed general of the Repliforce and commands a powerful fleet of airships. The Repliforce was designed as a militia group to clean up for the past mistakes with Sigma and Dr. Doppler, but when they express their desire for Reploid independence from humans, they are branded as Mavericks. Given Storm Owl's illustrious career fighting for the good of humans and Reploids alike, this comes as a shocking betrayal. He still has the courtesy to salute you before battle though, and I love how his fatigues are mixed with his owl look. Probably one of the best visual designs of the X series. When his ships and his laser cannons fail him, Storm Owl relies on his technological manipulation of the air, or as I like to call it, Cyber Air, as it has this matrixy green tint to it. He starts with the best windshield on the list. Sure, John as Eye of the Storm can reduce damage, but Owl's shield makes him invincible unless you have the one weapon that trumps him. He keeps it on most of the time, leaving only a small window of vulnerability between attacks. With his safety pretty much assured, he fires orbs of cyber air, usually in sets of four, that home in on their target. He's also got some cyclones that can cover half the screen at a time, and a windmill attack that shoots continuous orbs in four directions at a time. If you're going to challenge him without the aiming laser, you'll have to stay light on your feet. My only question is... How the hell is he controlling all of this wind? I'm sorry, I need to know these things. I know it's technological, but what's the analog here? Is he a weather machine? Are there metal particles in the air that he can magnetize? I don't see the giant turbines on him, so if it's not magic, what is it? Nano machine, son. Nobody asked you, Armstrong! <laughs> Coming in at number three, we have... Wait a minute. Comic, you in there? No, I'm not coming out. Dude, I need the script for number three. You said you were writing this. I can't. They'll yell at me. <sighs> Who will yell at you? The Warcraft fan base. Uh, dude, is this about Brawl? I barely even played WoW. All I played was Warcraft 3 and Dota 1. Yeah, well that makes two of us. 
I thought if I started using Warcraft characters, it would make the fan base happy. I thought they'd appreciate me trying to write something different, but all they did was get mad because I put him too low. Well, we did put him below Jace, and Mario was number one. Of course people were pissed. Well, if they think we put the characters too low, they don't get Warcraft characters. Well, we can't just leave Valeria out. We've already established that we've played the games, and if we just ignore them, it's only gonna get worse. Do I have to do the lore again? No, I think they got it. Okay, I'll write another Warcraft entry. Just promise they won't yell at me in the comments. Comic, we're aspiring video game journalists. Of course they're gonna yell at us. So, yeah, Alaria Windrunner, a captain in the Alliance and eldest of the Windrunner sisters. You might recall her from my top 10 archers. Unlike with Zaldan, however, Alaria rises above in both categories, as I feel she's found a happy marriage between archery and aromancy. This served her well during her command in the Second War against the Orcs. Not only did her elven traits help her hear enemy placement on the winds and plan strategies, her magic let her fire arrows with better distance, accuracy, and power. She's remembered as a hero for her last assault, when she led her brigade through a portal to the dark world of Draenor to cut off their connection to Azeroth. With victory achieved and Draenor falling apart, her only escape was through another dark portal leading to... Well, no one really knows where. She is presumed dead, but never forgotten. She is memorialized in the form of a statue in the Valley of Heroes, and a DLC commander in Hearthstone. Of course, my personal experience with the Windrunner was in Dota 1, back when it was just a mod of Warcraft 3. I've mentioned these skills before, but most involve enchanting arrows with wind magic. Shacklebolt fetters a target to another enemy or a tree by pinning them with a solid strand of air. Yeah, try wrapping your head around that one. Power Shot puts the wind behind the arrow to drive it for miles, destroying enemies and trees alike. Like Ash's ultimate from League of Legends, but as a basic spell. And her own ultimate has her channel wind through her own body to increase her adrenaline and, by extension, her attack speed. Eh. Usually when you inject air into someone's bloodstream, it kills them. But I guess it's different for elves. She also pioneered the spell Windrunner, using her own name. A popular enchantment in the Warcraft mythos, Windrunner or Windwalk increases movement speed, decreases movement speed of those around you, and makes you non-targetable, and in some cases, invisible. It essentially turns Alaria into wind, perfect for quick escapes or thrilling pursuits. What I didn't mention last time was Dota 2. Though Dota 2 is now independent from the Warcraft mythos, taking place in a different universe entirely, there is a successor to Elaria Windrunner named Lirale, the Wind Ranger. She's still an intelligence-based hero that relies heavily on agility, and all of her spells and abilities are replicated, barring patches and tweaks. It's weird. Elaria didn't live to be in World of Warcraft, but through Dota 1 spiritually transcended the Blizzard franchise into Dota 2, just as another character. Wait a minute. She went into a dark portal. No one knows where it led. She hasn't been heard from since. Is it possible that Lirale is Aurelia? <laughs> Malfurion's beard, she's alive! I, I know she's not an elf and I know that Lirale has her own lore, but this is bigger than that. This is some Adventure Time Farm World crap. Or maybe I just don't know enough about either of these two games. For the might of the elves. I hope you guys are appreciating how far I went out of my comfort zone this week. First Golden Sun, then Undernight and Birth, then talking about Warcraft again, and now Monster Hunter. This is the Kushala Daora. That may be a mouthful, but it's an easier title than Giant Metal Wind Spitting Elder Dragon. We'll just call it the Kushala. Kushala is a unique breed of monster. It feeds on iron and malachite ore, which gives it metallic skin that protects it from most elements. It frequently has to shed that skin before rust sets in, but a new coat grows back almost instantly for a healthy Kushala. You'd think that would mean that it's pretty heavy, and it is, but the Elder Dragon beats gravity with its sail-like wings, which grow proportionally larger to its body than most of any other dragon. These wings also assist the Kushala in its primary hunting tactic, manipulating the weather. The Metal Dragon can soar at unprecedented speeds, creating a wind current behind it, and blow gusts around and below it that can even freeze the ground. This combined with its wind breath help it push around even the portliest of monster hunters. Though also seen in the deserts and in the jungles, Kushala makes her living atop the highest peaks of the tundra. 
and man are you lucky that there are no ring outs in this game. You're already freezing in your armor, but the Kushala's mighty blows will only help the temperature drop, potentially freezing you in. Its wind cannon spits out what I can only describe as Rasengan's, while its wind stream is a long range bellow, during which it will turn its body 360 degrees to try and take you out. And when enraged, it puts up a wind aura that protects its torso and legs. It doesn't help that if you're knocked back into the snow, you might roll up into an adorable snowman. Hey, you worked hard to make it all the way up this mountain, and Kushala Daora won't disappoint you. Get yourself a Star Wars team of three and make sure you pack your earmuffs. Remember the entries from last week? We talked about a guy named Rubicante, a servant of Golbez and leader of Golbez's elemental archfiends. Well, here's the thing. Rubicante may be the leader, but I don't think that makes him the strongest. The archfiend of wind, Barbaricia, takes the appearance of a giant woman with blonde Rapunzel-like hair. Those locks aren't for climbing though. With a quick whip of her head, her hair swirls around her into a nearly impenetrable tornado, behind which she wrecks stratospheric fury unlike anything the world has ever seen. The name actually is borrowed from a demon in Dante's Inferno, which had a notably unkempt beard. The name is a combination of the Latin word Ricia, meaning curly, and barbar meaning beard, or, with respect to our aerodynamic archfiend, hair. Though curly in this case could better be translated as violently whirling. Golbez keeps Barbaricia as one of his most trusted protectors, naming her the Empress of Winds and tasking her to guard the main base of operations, the Tower of Zot, with her posse, the Mage's Sisters. When the sisters fail, however, Barbaricia puts her own spin on the fight with the aforementioned impenetrable hair tornado. L'Oreal, because she'll kill you! On the surface, her mane might seem a lot like Rubicante's cape, and they do have some similarities in their defensive capabilities. Unlike Rubicante, though, Barbaricia doesn't just arbitrarily lower her shield, and she has no trouble hitting you at full power with physical or magical attacks, whether shielded or not. If she puts up her hair, you have to make her put it down. In tornado form, she counters all physical attacks with strong physical blows, or maelstrom, which hits all party members and reduces their HP to the single digits. Always keep a healer ready for an oncoming Maelstrom. If you don't heal your party members fast enough, she'll finish you off with a few well-placed kicks. So, an unbreakable defense and a devastating offense. How do you stop this girl? Well, she doesn't have any magical resistances aside from the predictable immunity to Quake, so black magic would be a good bet. If you had any black mages in the party, the first time you fight her, Tella, Rydia, and Palum are all woefully absent from the party. The only thing that can knock her out of the vortex is an attack directly from above, Kane's jump. And you know what? That's pretty cool. Think about the physics here. The centripetal force of a tornado automatically expels everything in a 360 degree axis, so the only way to get in would be through the cone above, diving directly into the eye of the storm. Any coincidence that the character absolutely crucial to taking this girl down is named Kane Highwind? Theming, you gotta love it. With one good hit, she'll stay her follicles. But that doesn't mean that she's down for the count. Barbaricia continues her assault with Tornado for single targets and Maelstrom for hampering the entire party, and in a 3D remake, she can conjure lightning. So Ivan's not the only Aeromancer that can produce electricity. There's not really a good defense at this point, just keep popping healing spells and hit her with everything you've got, and hopefully you can knock her out before her bad hair day strikes anew. Barbaricia has also dropped by as a boss in the After Years, and remakes of Final Fantasy 1, always with a new Cyclone to terrorize the party. It's not like Barbaricia is a particularly memorable character either, but all of these years later, I still remember this boss fight from Final Fantasy 4, even back when it was Final Fantasy 2. It forced me to think differently, time myself around the active time battle system, and keep cures ready for a hurricane to hit me at any second. And when every attack I made glanced off of her and knocked Cecil on his armored behind, it forced me to think more creatively, as much about solving a puzzle as defeating a boss. 
It helped that jump was one of my favorite abilities in the game, but when I made the right move and I saw that stupid shield come down after my third attempt at the battle, I was pretty excited. Also, I gotta say, summing up this list, this was the hardest element to compile candidates for, partly because my usual foundation of RPGs fell out beneath me. Dungeons and & Dragons and Ultima cemented the archetypal trinity of elements, heat damage, cold damage, and electrical damage. With all RPGs owing their inspiration in some part to these sources, it's usually easy to find these spells in any RPG, Western or Eastern. That safety net is kind of gone with wind. There aren't many wind-based specialists in Final Fantasy, and in truth, there aren't many in most RPGs. But that just means that when an Aeromancer does show up, they break the curve and make their own rules. How do I beat Rubicante? Use Quaker Ice. How do I beat Cagnazzo? Use Thunder. How do I beat Barbaricia? Use... Uh... Huh. In a sea of fire and thunder, this creature design really stands out to me. And no, it's not just because she's a scantily clad Amazon. It's because she's different. The joy of this list has been that even though the symbolism exists, the tropes are harder to contain. Air is the element of freedom. And here we have a lot of air elementals just kind of doing their own thing. There's endless possibilities with something as formless as air. They pour over their magic tomes, improve their aim, they strap turbines to their arms. When their opponents face them, their first thought isn't, okay, another Aeromancer. It's, whoa, how do I heck do I fight this? It's that level of creative versatility that makes this list one of my favorites to date. And I'm happy to name Barbaricia the number one greatest Aeromancer in video games. I am the Green Scorpion, and I'll see you next week. Bring a towel! And you thought it was just a harmless breeze.